Welcome to Evensong, our Saturday night service here at Second Congregational Church. Uh, when we typically meet, it's so casual. I was just talking to a couple of uh, people this week, uh, but I, I got to talk to iTech, one of our regular attenders, and we said what we miss the most about Evensong is sitting together, sitting together and having dinner. That's actually my favorite part of church. You don't know that. But when I'm done preaching and I've said my hellos, I like to go to my office and just, you know, take a breather. But when I come back, uh, we have tables in our, uh, in right where we have the service, we have dinner tables. And when I see adults talking with kids, you know, my kids talking to, you know, Jackie, I tech, Gene, it's, it's like they have such a big family. And these aren't just regular people. These are some of the most wonderful people I've ever met in my life you all who attend here. And the fact that you invite us in, my, you know, the Garens and the Grants as your spiritual leaders, just just so you know, there's more, you, you do more than just pay us. You let us be a part of your community. And uh, it really, it's, it's such a moving thing for me and such a rewarding job that I, I want you to know that if you feel like you miss even song, I want you to know I miss even song because I miss that moment after church. It's gonna come back, and my hope is this: hold on to that, remember it, and uh, maybe there's ways that you all can get together and ha watch church. Last week, in full disclosure, last week and this week we pre-recorded our services. Uh, Ellie went off to a wedding. Uh, for Lori Meek's daughter in Texas. And, uh, you know, we sometimes Ellie and I need a break. I, I'm here, and I record at the very last minute just in case any, there's any current news. But uh, I want you to know that I really miss you. Ellie misses you. Ashley misses you. Molly, Max, our whole family, Max and Liz and all of the kids. We cannot wait to have you back but we want to make sure it's fully safe and that there's no one of the big things the concerns is we don't want our we don't want to ask our deacons to police people. Hey, no hugs over there. You know, we don't want to put people in that position. So, you might see some other churches opening and maybe they have the staff and the capability to do that and we're working towards that. So, uh, I think Max is going to be doing an 8:30 in the in the morning service, and he'll announce that, uh, or you can see it in the newsletter, a newsletter, or on our website. Uh, but stay tuned, and I think you can register for that. Um, there's also some other great offerings that uh, Max is doing for adults, and that uh, we're still doing confirmation over Zoom and youth group, and we are even in the process of process of building an internship program for the simple purpose of helping keep these kids busy uh, you know while they're out of school and can't go many places uh, so there's a quick update uh, we miss you and I I'm still reaching you you can call me just so you know I will get back to you it as you can imagine pastors have a big uh, a big queue of of people to reach out to but we love doing it and uh, we take a lot of time to do it so you let me know if you would like to uh, catch up I wouldn't even be against going to meet for lunch or something on the avenue uh, if if they're still meeting outside so feel free if you're if you're open to that Sean s-h-a-w-n at 2cc.org I'd love to to catch up and see how you're doing
different kind of prayer I'm gonna do a different kind of praying this week and I figured it was something I discovered while I was meditating you know sometimes I'll be meditating at my house and I feel guilty I've shared this you know I, I meditate for maybe 20 minutes 30 minutes I do some yoga uh, also just to kind of stretch my body out and get in a place where I can really center in but <laughs> You know, realistically, I'm not some monk living in a monastery. I have a family. And there's times when I'm meditating that I hear the, you know, I could hear Elsa singing Frozen in the background, and I could hear water splashing in the tub and all the noises at home, and it's distracting. And I go, ugh. You know, sometimes I actually will be meditating going, you know, why are these people making so much noise when I'm trying to connect with God. <laughs> and just to prove to you that the Holy Spirit does speak, I heard the Spirit speak to me saying this, Sean, do you know that there's another way to meditate? So I said, oh, is it, is it easier? Is it shorter? And the Spirit said, it's a little, e it's, it's shorter, but it, it might not be easier. Define easier, right? Because the Holy Spirit said this, me there's you, you don't have to sit indian style you know you don't have to sit there cross-legged and and you know breathing and, and you don't have to do yoga 
You don't have to have incense burning. You don't have to have a Bible in front of you. What the Holy Spirit said is, if you go and play with your kids, and I don't mean to just play, Sean. I don't want you to just play like to get it out of the way. You go play. Play like when you were a kid. If, if you go do those dishes, Sean, if you go help just bring joy in your house, that is a certain kind of meditation. But it requires the same level of focus that you're going to go have a conversation with them, with a person, and listen. Do you know how to listen? I'll tell you a trick. When somebody's speaking, try to sum up what they're saying and repeat it back to them. It's called reflective listening. You, I have literally had full conversations with people where I did that, and the conclusion was this. You're the first person that's ever heard me. You know, sometimes you're just so in a rush to respond to people. But the Holy Spirit said to me, that's a type of meditation, Sean. And I tried it, and it's hard. But when I gave into it, when I just submitted to, okay, I'm going to listen. I'm going to really listen to this person. I actually got in the same state I do when I'm meditating, but with another person. And in these, these transactions, I see, oh, there is something divine happening, something palpable, something you can feel. So it could be cleaning, listening, doing something, going to the gym, doing something that you don't necessarily want to do. That's meditation and prayer. It's not, it's not fun if we, you know, when you're first figuring it out. But when you're able to tap into uh, that, the divine state in meditation, it's so beautiful. It's what draws me back and back. And what the Holy Spirit showed me and what I tasted and actually felt was that same feeling when I participated in everyday life intentionally in a meditative way. So no closing our eyes today. No breathing in and no breathing out. And you could still do that. You need to do that. You're doing it anyway. But the idea is this. I'm going to go out and intentionally meditate on the environment around me and see how God is in all things. It's quite an experiment. But we will say it, our traditional prayer. Say it with me. Our Father, who art in heaven, our God, you're up there. Holy is your name. There's no one like it. That's what holy means. Let your kingdom come. Your kingdom that was somewhere, wherever it is, I hope it comes on earth as it is in heaven. Stop praying that, oh, one day I'll go to heaven. This prayer is saying, one day I hope heaven comes here while I'm alive. Can you forgive, give me my daily bread today? I need to eat this truth, your wisdom. I need to taste it. And forgive me of my mistakes, of my sins. And help me to have the grace to forgive other people when they make mistakes. Make sure I don't allow myself to be tempted into evil. But lead me away from it. And if you do that, Holy One, I'm going to do whatever it takes to make sure that you have all the glory and have all the power and all the honor forever and ever. Amen. Oh, oh I need to move my cape on. <clears throat> Whenever you're better.
<laughs> when I was in the Coast Guard, I had to do this thing called watch duty. And watch duty is, it's actually not that bad. It's just when you are new you get put on the four to eight rotation that's means you uh do watch from 4 p.m to 8 p.m that's great but then you got to do 4 a.m to 8 a.m it really throws you off and if they you get to sleep a couple extra hours but if they need you like if there's a drug bust or something they will wake you up they don't care so it was a challenging experience but one of the beautiful things I got to do was, you know, you're in the middle of the Caribbean Ocean. The sea, sometimes the sea was so flat, it was like glass, like almost like you were just hovering on nothing. And there in the Caribbean, you can see every star, shooting stars. You can even see satellites and planets. It's so clear. But there was even another level of clear. We, got, we had night vision goggles. And if you put night vision goggles on, if you thought there were a lot of stars before, I don't, maybe you've been upstate or maybe you have been out in the ocean, the, it's, it's so beautiful. But when you put on night vision goggles, there, there are so many stars, it's almost like there is no blackness. <laughs> it's completely lit up. And you'll see shooting stars like normal just shooting across, gliding along with the ship, you know, off in the distance. But it, it was so powerful. So powerful. Why? Why was that a powerful experience? Why will I never forget it? Because the moment when I thought I saw everything, I mean, the whole point of me being up from 4 to 8 a.m. was to keep watch. My whole job was to look out. And in looking out, you know, I had my eyes and I had my binoculars and you do your, your scan of the horizon. But there, when I was given even another uh, tool to see even clearer, what was there, what was always there. It's not like it, there were, when I put the goggles on, more stars appear, you know, were put in the sky. It was that I was able to see what was already there, but I was incapable of seeing before. That is what Jesus, I'm not even kidding. Jesus is offering us some night vision goggles. And the Bible is the object, almost like the sky that I looked out on. But what lenses that I'm using you know, if I could use my regular lens, and you see it, we all have Bible stories somewhere in our head, somewhere, even if you didn't go to church, somewhere along the lines, you've heard these stories. And there's a level of understanding. Oh, Jonah got swallowed by a whale. You know, the uh, sun stopped when the Israelites were fighting in the, in the Valley of Ajalon. You know, Jesus raised people from the dead. And if you look at it with a certain lens that's how it looks that's just it is what it is but Jesus introduces another way of looking at it and we learn about this in school it's called hermeneutics hermeneutics it's uh, comes from this the, the word uh, Hermes you know maybe you've seen it it's like a kind of bag right but Hermes is this cunning God in, in ancient myth it's this God that uh, you can't see them right away. They like to be mysterious. And in seminary, we actually take a course called hermeneutics. And the course, I can't see it. I'm going to put my glasses on. Hermeneutics is, teaches us that on the surface, there's a, a reading. You know, on the surface, there's you know, the skyline. But if you put on another pair of lenses, the story goes deeper. And lenses can be the equivalent to knowing more about the archaeology of the Bible. These cops car, the, the, the fire department, is always driving by. Uh, I love them, so we got to give them grace. Let's say, God bless them wherever they're going. That, that's what we do. See, if somebody cuts you off when you're driving, you could just throw a little blessing out. 
it's still the same uh, gesture as raising your hand, but but it's not this way. It's it's this way. It's a thank you, God bless. <laughs> but back to what I was saying. So archaeology, understanding culture, going to Israel and excavating these things called tells. They have uh, these little hills that uh, have so much, so many artifacts and give us a lot of insight. What I'm really saying is that the knowledge we've gained, you know, through the humanities, through the liberal arts and sciences, have completely blown open the way we can view the Bible. So in today's story, when I read it to you, we're, we're continuing in Acts. We talked about last week, we've talked about Pentecost. We've talked about a little hypocrisy in the early church. You know, Peter, he's the betrayer of Jesus. And he gives a speech about how betrayers are the worst things in the world, worst people in the world. So we see that there's the Gospels, the Gospels, which... You know, when you look at it, it's the story of Jesus. And then there's the book of Acts, which is the story after Jesus, how the church got started. But again, do not be deceived by the one set of lenses that you can read this scripture by. Because once, I sh once we see today that the stories, you know, sometimes we read the stories and we give the Bible uh, a lot of leeway. We give the Bible a lot of leeway in this sense. Oh, it says it here, so. Yeah. It says it here. My reason and logic dispute it, but I have faith. Therefore, it overrides my, my, uh, my knowledge. But if you read the story today in Acts chapter 5, we're in Acts chapter 5, we're not rushing through, we're taking our time, going slowly through it but also while at the same time keeping the interest there because in this story we're going to hear this is this is i'm so glad this this story is in the bible because it's so crazy that it shouldn't be if you are making up a religion and all those people that say christianity is not real or how do how can you trust the stories in the book they would have left this story out. You and I would have left this story out. But they didn't. They didn't leave this story out. In the Bible, they make so many mistakes. And they leave them in. And I love it. Commentators and pastors and churches, they try to cover it up. They might, you've probably never heard this passage. Because here's the gist. I'll give you the gist. You can read the whole thing. Peter how many churches has Peter started before? That's right, zero. Peter is now in charge of the church, and he's never led a church. He betrayed Jesus. He has no experience. Probably the worst person you could have in charge. Most of the New Testament, you would think, maybe it's written by Peter. It's not. It's written by Paul. Paul was never met Jesus, was persecuting Christians, and was became a much better leader than Peter. I love Peter. There's nobody in the Bible that I'm more like than Peter. Because Peter is really passionate. And he's going to wrestle with how do you maintain passion? How do you keep it? But here we're going to see one of his passionate blunders. Sorry, my nose is a little runny. And it's been, you know, when you live with your fan, you know, in these times when you're living with everybody on top of each other, especially with kids, that you know, that little cold just never goes away, and it's just, you know, anyway. Sorry if I rub my nose a, a couple times. So this story, <laughs> I want you to read it because you almost might not believe me that it's in here. So Peter is, they they they've expressed in the previous chapters. How the church was this beautiful, you know, almost uh, very uh, communal. It was like a kibbutz. You know, everybody uh, worked. They all got equal pay. If you were the manager, you, you got the same pay as the janitor. And they would sell everything. The idea was they would go sell all their goods and bring them to the apostles' feet, it says. And the apostles would redistribute it. It's very, very Bernie Sanders. 
I was teaching a confirmation class, and the kids, I was reading one of these passages, they said, are you a socialist? And I said, no, no, it's in the Bible. There's a way of being uh, fair, <laughs> but we also have to understand we're reading an ancient book. Uh, these are poor people, and so this is more of a uh, common thing than uh, in, in religious communities. There were other communities like the Essenes who did stuff like this. So, uh, you know, here's the idea is they took their things that they privately owned and brought them to the church community. They sold this stuff and everybody, it says nobody had any need. Now, wow. You know, nobody had any need? Okay. <laughs> the, the, the stories in the Bible are very idyll idyllic. You know, they, they paint this picture like everything's perfect. Like I said before, let's put, you know, you put, when I can't, when I don't have my glasses on, I can't see clearly. Everything's fuzzy. It, it almost all blurs in. But when I put on my glasses, I can see this details, the specifics. In this story, Peter tells how this is all happening, but then he tells a story about this couple. Uh, what's their names? An Ananias and Sapphira. He tells this story about how everybody's doing this. And they, uh, they go and sell all their stuff. They have, you know, some extra money, but they wanted to keep a little extra for themselves. So they bring a big chunk of money to Peter, and Peter goes, "Is that all? Is that everything?" "Oh yes, it is. It's everything." And then Peter, you know, scolds them and says, "You know, you're lying against the Holy Spirit," <laughs> and. They fall down and die. Peter curses them. And it's this idea that uh, if you don't give your money to the church, you'll die. I mean, imagine that was our stewardship campaign. Our, our passage for our stewardship campaign would be Acts chapter 5. If you don't meet your, your, uh, <laughs> your commitment, the Holy Spirit might strike you down. Now, you laugh, but I've seen these tactics employed. In the military, they use fear well to motivate us. And here you'll see, you know, we're reading the Acts, and this crazy story actually was used to legitimize the collection of tithes. It's still used today. There, I love watching on Facebook, you know, you had all the... the uh, out there types who still believe this that you got to give god god's due and if you don't there will be consequences and the early church used this kind of language to consolidate power to make sure the, the their followers were committed but it but we can Today, this is the relationship I want us to start to have with the Bible. That just because it says that story, it doesn't mean, oh, well, we don't do that. We're, we're more individualistic and we, we don't sell our houses and, and do that kind of stuff. I, I don't know any church in this area that does. It's not, but sometimes you read the Bible and you go, oh, well, maybe we're not doing it. Or we just wipe this passage out and never cover it. What I want us to do is to be readers of the Bible. You're going to have to be somebody who has the ability to just discern where, where God is in the story. And where God is in Acts chapter 5 is here. Even in our holy work, we're going to make mistakes. Even as your pastors, even as deacons and council members, leaders, we're not going to always be right. And we shouldn't have this type of leadership that uses uh, scare tactics. Christianity is an invitation. Christianity is a way of living. It's more than an institution. It's a way of life. But Peter wanted he, he thought 
You know, if I can, if I can build churches with a strong leadership and a strong income, we will be able to rival the, the, the synagogues that kicked us out. And that'll be my way of, of uh, making it up to Jesus for not being there when he needed me the most. You know, one lens, the story says, give all your money and fear the pastor uh, because he can call on God to strike you down if you don't pay your tithe. But if, if you put on your lenses, you can see that Peter, Peter doesn't fully get Jesus e even after he's still going to wrestle. You and I don't, I don't fully get Jesus. I would be a fool to say I do. The idea is, Peter had to keep learning how to be a leader. He made he clearly made a mistake saying this. And the Bible records his error. This is not good theology on Peter's part. But it's such a blessing that it's here because it teaches us. I mean, how long did the church have such a stronghold over people's lives where it made demands like this? Where popes could excommunicate you, literally giving you the sense that you're now abandoned by God. I'm saying we are now in an age where we can counter this and wrestle and reconcile this. The Bible makes mistakes. So I find that God is often uh, more uh, clear in my mistakes. You know, when I make a mistake, that's the definition of sin. It's a mistake to miss the mark. You know, if I, if I make a mistake with work, if I make a mistake, uh, you know, at home, if I make a mistake in anything, you expect some grace. You don't expect God's hand to be ready to smack you. And the church, it, it, it's tempted to use fear. Fear is a great way of controlling people. It's even in our day and age, right? We look to our leaders and we expect that they're telling us the truth all the time. But we've learned. You can't do that in this day. You gotta look deeper. You gotta, come on. You gotta put on your lens to see that this story is ridiculous. And the Bible's so honest that it includes it. Human leaders make mistakes even when they're in positions of where God has anointed them to be the leaders. Saul, David, everybody, Adam, Eve, everybody who God has anointed and ordained has made a mistake. And that's real life. That's real life. The Bible is dealing with real life. So as you read this week, I hope this helps. You're going to read a story and you could say to yourself, read Acts 5 and say, this is, this is out there. But you have new lenses. That's what our church is giving you. I learned this in school, and I want to break it down and give it to you. It was so much work to understand. It's so much work. Do you know how hard it is to say to have somebody say, but a professor, a PhD, who lived in Israel and speaks all of the languages that would look at you and say, Sean, you're here to learn about the Bible. You already knew everything? Then why did you come here? Why did you spend all the money to to learn about the Bible. You know, there's people who can go on WebD and maybe guess a good diagnosis. That's some kind of religion. That's how some religions are run. But do you want to go to the doctor? Do you want to know yourself the truth? I want to encourage that this week. You can read the Bible and enjoy it and what we want to offer you here at Evensong is even a more enjoyable experience by offering glasses. I think I gave a sermon a few weeks ago about glasses and glue. You can check that out. But the story doesn't change. We read it and we find the fluctuation of uh, divine and human, divine and human. And in that process, we see a glimpse into who we are. Did you know that you are a child of God? divine and human. And Christ comes to say, hey, put on your divine glasses. Do you see who you are? You are a holy creature made in the image of a God. Do you want to live up to that? Or do you want to understand that? 
Do you want to understand the nature of who you are and, and what this life is all about? Well, the stories in the Bible give us great examples that holiness is not a steady, balanced pursuit. We wished it was. We're, we're aiming for that. But because we're humans, it's this. And it's filled with mistakes and errors. Addressing those mistakes and errors will give us the courage to modify and update any translations or misinterpretations we've had in the past. And in doing so, the Bible will become truly what it claims to be, a light forward, a guide, a, a staff, a rod and a staff. You know, when the shepherds led the sheep, they're not on top of the sheep. They create a perimeter and say, stay within this perimeter and I can watch over you. And that's what Christ asks us to do. Don't write off the scripture. Give it another chance. But let's look at it with different glasses, with different lenses, and we'll see that just like when I was out in the ocean and I saw us the stars and the star, it was the sky was still beautiful. But I only saw it in part. When I put on those night vision goggles, I saw what was really out there. And I saw that light, there wasn't a place there wasn't light. I had a clear picture of what's above me and around me. And in the Bible, when you see, we got this clear picture, this story comes to life, and then you're like, oh, yeah, I've made some, you know, as a parent, I tried to parent with a little bit of fear. As a teacher, or maybe as a boss, is there another approach? Christ invites us to put on these lenses, and I invite you to wear them this week. Uh, if, we, if you do, feel free to ask me any questions, email me, reach out. Uh, uh, it's been a crazy couple weeks. You all have supported uh, my wife and I. As you know, the, our, the school closed, uh, Max's school closed, and I, my email box just is, is huge, but I'm making my way through it. So if I haven't responded to you, uh, I apologize. I am working on that. Uh, but I hope this message helped. I hope that you will read Acts 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That's where we are. Maybe you can take on one each day of the week. And it will be great because when we catch up next week, we'll just continue right there. Thanks for uh, really uh, stopping in, taking the time to uh, gather around this, this truth. Uh, that's the thing that that unites us. And uh, I hope it can be useful for you in your everyday life. God bless.
there's those moments where you think, ah, oh, I can't do it anymore. I can't take it. But we have the Bible and we have our own stories. Look behind you. You've gotten this far. You will get further. There will be good days and bad days. But with God, all days are divine and holy and have something to offer us. If we just can put these lenses on, we will see all that God is doing. And when we see how much and how God is in all things, that thing that we struggle with, our faith, will move actually out of the faith realm into the knowing realm. I know this to be true because I've lived it. I heard about it. I've read about it. But now I live it. Go this week. Not as people who just have read the story of Acts, but as people who are the story of Acts, made alive in 2020. God bless. Go in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I will see you next week. Thank you.